you a uh, global gag tonight. We have two special guests. We're coming from South Louisiana, uh, our home state. And uh, one is Mr. Nathan Cotton, who is the um, STEM curriculum specialist for Terrebonne Parish. And the other one is Ms. Nicole Cotton, his wife, uh, who is the instructional technology specialist at Nichols State. And I had the privilege of getting to know them about, oh, I don't know, two years ago. And they were so gracious and so kind and held a QSM grant on a Saturday, <laughs> very early in the morning, for about nine teachers who were very gracious and walked us through this very tedious process of writing grants. Uh -oh. So it looks like her internet must have gone out. So yeah, so when, when she comes back on, um, we'll go ahead and she can finish sharing her story. So everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, and we'll go ahead and I'll turn it over to Nathan and Nicole. Great. Welcome everybody. Thank you uh, for uh, attending this evening uh, on the Sunday evening. Uh, so we tried to catch a day in between hurricanes. So uh, we managed to do that. We're in South Louisiana, so uh, we're doing okay with that. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and start the presentation and uh, go from there. Nicole, can you see my presentation? Yes. Great. All right. So um, we titled uh, our uh, presentation, Get Your Groove On with Grants uh, for STEM Resources. So our purpose today is to uh, kind of give you some ideas for STEM resources. And then it's always great to get ideas, uh, but it's another thing to find the funding in order to uh, secure those resources. So we hope to um, you can find a uh, means to uh, secure some of those funds. So um, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Nathan Cotton. Uh, I'm with Terrebonne Parish School District. This is, I think, my 22nd or 23rd year uh, in the district. Um, I'm also a member of the Louisiana Science Teachers Association. I've served as the uh, newsletter editor and president and past president, and et cetera, and now I'm currently the treasurer. So I'll turn it over to Nicole. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am currently an instructional technology specialist at Nickel State University. I give our faculty personal development on e-learning on campus and our learning management system, Moodle. Prior to working at Nickel State, I was actually an informal science educator for 12 years at LumCon, and I wrote a few grants while I was there. And so I'm kind of on opposite ends of the spectrum while Nathan's kind of in the middle with traditional teaching programs. So hopefully we can give you guys some great information so you can write grants to get some tools and equipment for your classroom today. And I'll turn it back over to Nathan. It was, uh, give you an opportunity to let us know who you are and um, so we have a poll everywhere and we wanted to attempt this and and see how uh, it goes um, if it if we get bogged down we'll just move forward but um, so what you do is you can either copy that link uh, at the top uh, that says pollev.com and then Nathan Cotton 559 you can go to that site um, <clears throat> or you can text uh, Nathan Cotton 559 uh, to the number of 37607. And then as you're kind of in that poll through your text message, then you can respond with what grade band that you teach. So if we'll give you a minute to <clears throat> try that out. And um, if you're um, a district admin, then uh, I guess just choose one uh, that you work with the most. <laughs> we'll give you a minute to respond to that poll. We have a couple more questions that we're going to have you participate with. So once you get it in the first time, then you'll just be able to respond uh, moving forward with that same link or that same text message. Um, and I noticed they put it in the uh, live chat um, in order to post. So since that message is in the 
Good. We're having a couple of responses come in. That's great. We just wanted to kind of identify what kind of uh, audience we were speaking to uh, directly and anticipate some of the questions or at least hope we could address some of our um, talking points to those audiences, those participants. So it's in the live chat, so I'm going to go ahead and move forward. Um, it looks like we're, we have a wide range with uh, pre-K to two or, and then a uh, participant from high school. And so um, I, what we present tonight um, will cover, will address uh, pre-K to 12 and even uh, some college stuff. But um, uh, obviously this is uh, mostly directed to pre-K 12. So this is uh, the next question that we would like to follow up with and uh, find out what you teach. So if you're pre-K two, um, you can contain obviously, um, or high school to know, and you can just text that uh, subject to us, and it should pop up on the screen um, as you as we move forward. So I'll see we have an ELA teacher, speech. And so uh, I've used poll everywhere um, in uh, presentations in the past. And it's something that teachers can use as a brainstorming opportunity. And you notice this is kind of form in a cloud. Um, so if you create this uh, and, and share it, if you create a poll uh, for your students, then they can uh, respond and uh, it becomes a brainstorming page and it will collect and um, if somebody types English again then um, obviously those words will grow um, in size and so the more frequently uh, covered areas will show up more. So it looks like we have a wide variety. I'm glad to see um, that we have a few ELA and of course, math and Spanish, the diverse group. So I'm going to allow you to continue to respond uh, to those uh, questions, but we're gonna move on and uh, um, wish everyone a happy National STEM Day. This was, uh, I guess we could have said that we planned it to be on National STEM Day, but I would be lying, so it was coincidental, but um, we definitely are uh, glad and just a fun fact that it's uh, National Cappuccino Day. So we had our share of caffeine this morning as well. So, All right, we're going to dig in. Um, and so some of the things that we want to talk about STEM resources, and this is just a sample. Obviously, there's a ton of stuff out there for STEM. Um, and then obviously, we're going to talk about some grant writing tips or give you some grant writing tips and some. Um, so and then we're going to come back to some of those grant resources for the STEM uh, resources that we share, and then networking, we wanted to touch on that, um, which is one of the reasons that uh, that we're here this evening. So <clears throat> this next slide is just a, uh, like I said, just a sample of education resources. We know LEGO education is a big part of that. Um, and uh, As far as uh, supporting STEM in K-12, um, and so most, some of you may have heard of robotics competitions and FLL, which is first Lego league. And so it definitely gives students an opportunity to uh, program and build robots and compete and, and, uh, work together. And, and, um, uh, not only that, it's not only just about the robotics, but it's also these uh, talking points and the ability for them to present and, um, critically think and, and, uh, when they're designing and support their design and whatnot. So there's uh, Lego offers quite a bit of um, resources uh, and, and free resources, I should say, at, at that, you know, outside of the Legos. Um, but definitely they provide the activities. Um, this is the EV3 Mindstorm uh, kit. Um, and they have it 
from different grade levels. They ha uh, have different products for different grade levels. Um, and so they have something called We Do 2.0, where they are able to uh, share some uh, our, uh, kids in that primary grade levels are able to program. And then it's just a stepping stone. So they move up to the EV3 in grades four to eight. And then of course, to the uh, uh, the first robotics in high school, where they're kind of building from scratch and they, uh, uh, they put the Legos away and uh, they design uh, some pretty awesome robots. But um, this is the page, the landing page for Lego education. And so, um, like I said, they have early learning, primary, secondary, and of course their products. So I'll bounce back. And um, they have responded to obviously the COVID impact. And so uh, they have something called First at Home. And you see that they're working on this uh, game on WPI launches virtual challenge to design a first inspired video game. Um, but they have stuff by grade band that you can uh, attend. Uh, and participate, and you notice it's free and flexible, pre to K twelve, uh, pre K to twelve STEM activities, um, and you see the session series. And so I'm just kind of directing you to these locations of where they are, um, and I think you have access to the slide deck um, in the chat, and so um, you can uh, browse. But definitely wanted to point you in those directions. And in the first robotics competition, uh, you see that they're building. Uh, uh, robots and this is uh, just a sample you can see the robots where they have different challenges and they have to move balls but it is very engaging if you haven't ever attended an event um, I encourage you to look um, if you're in the US look in the uh, <clears throat> just Google first community um, and you can find the uh, the person that's responsible for uh, first program in your state and so you just go to community and uh, start to uh, find that local support. And, and so there are people like, we'll mention John Deere, uh, but there are uh, companies out there that are looking to support uh, these robotics. So, all right, um, another point two is called STEM in Action. Uh, if you haven't heard of Hand to Mine, um, STEM in Action is a, it's a kit that's pre-designed um, and it follows the engineering design process. Um, it's only for K to five and they have it broken down by grade level. Uh, you can, and obviously the domain, whether it's life science or earth science or physical science, uh, you can choose by your state, select by your state. So if I go to Louisiana, you see it narrows it down a little bit based upon our standards. And so, so you know, solar house design challenge and you notice it's $300. And so that kind of goes into like, where are you going to get that $300? And that will lead into our next conversation about grants in just a, just a minute. So you can see that they have all the materials and the materials uh, cover uh, about six groups, uh, if I remember correctly. Um, and you see that it puts the grade level, assigns a grade level, and uh, some of it is consumable, but you notice like the lights are, uh, non-consumable and so you can obviously reuse those in the following year and probably like teachers are probably the best engineers that I know of. They'll find uh, products that can serve as substitute or um, um, and still without having to purchase an entire new kit. But that is uh, a pretty good kit and they, uh, if I go to STEM, I go to all STEM, they have turns of different items, but this is where you get to kind of explore and find out what you need and what meets your needs. But uh, I always like the STEM and action kits. They work really well for our K to five uh, kids um, that use them. So the next one I'm going to point to, uh, I think I'm gonna jump to uh, e-learning um, and something called Gizmos. I'm gonna log in real quick. And basically, especially this goes back to the COVID uh, or, or at home learning is that um, these are virtual simulations. Uh, you can see that they have STEM cases and that's something new that it, they didn't have when I was in the classroom. Um, and so this is pretty neat, but uh, it leads students through solving a problem um, and they have to collect data and, and, and do observations. And so 
you can see my recently uh, viewed. Um, and so I'm going to jump to Freefall Tower. You see that they have student exploration sheets, teacher's guides, uh, the answer keys, vocabulary sheets, the objectives that it's addressing. And so what's really neat from the community is it has submitted lesson materials uh, based upon uh, people that have implemented in their uh, classrooms. And you see that it's uh, worldwide because you see some of these that are in French. And so if I launch this gizmo, you notice to see, you see the, uh, I'm assuming that's the Tower Pisa. And so we'll take a ping pong ball and a golf ball and we'll leave it in air, hit play and watch the rate at which they fall and notice that the ping pong ball falls slower. And of course we can, this, this is an experiment that we can do or a demonstration that we can do or, or even have uh, kids, we can design an activity to have kids test different things and just explore in order to determine what effect it has, uh, what air has on the rate of falling objects. If we replay it, reset it, put it in a vacuum. We notice that they fall at the same rate, 2.86, 2.86 seconds. And so um, what's really neat, they have these tabs up here. It's graphing it for us. And uh, we could take a picture of that. Um, I know sometimes when I was in the classroom, if I was making assessments or if I had to make an item set or something of that nature, uh, I need to make a graph or, you know, it was hard for me to find images of graph. And yes, I could do it in Excel, but it'd be really neat if I could uh, just put some of these objects and get a different graph. Let's put it in air, hit play. And then look at the graph here and then have kids analyze uh, this graph. And so it's pretty user friendly. And um, uh, so that's just a tidbit. Um, and I'll tell you a little uh, secret that I also did. I do not have a paid account. I have a free license right now for, I believe it is uh, two weeks, two to four weeks of that nature. And that's room that I want in order to uh, use it for whatever standards I was teaching uh, at that time. But I, I planned uh, in advance to know when I was going to need those. So um, another thing is if I click Find Gizmos, I wanted to show you this, is that you can search the gate by standard. Or paid. And so if I scroll down here, I can say that I'm in the United States. And so I can select the state that I'm in and I'll go to Louisiana, and you notice it has mass standards, so it's also All right, guys, so it looks like our people in South Louisiana are having internet difficulties right now. So we'll give them a few minutes, uh, see if they can reboot and come back in. All right, guys. So like our people in South Louisiana are having internet right now. So we'll give them a few minutes. Oh, wait, so uh, you got to reveal the thing. Come back in. Can y'all hear us again? All right, yay, we're back. <laughs> See, I, I thought it goes. 
All right, so we're good so to everyone go. Everyone can hear me again? All right, yes. good. I'll go back, dive back in to share. Um, Michelle, can you tell me where where, where I, we got cut off? Was that yes, somewhere sir. around uh, digging into the standards for gizmos? You were just clicking on showing them how the Louisiana standards were. So y'all are doing beautiful. I love it. And so if we'll just do like we always do. We'll let the show keep going. <laughs> Correct. All right. Thank you. I'll go back in. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, am I sharing again? Yeah, share your screen. Okay, so um, let me go back to find gizmos, go by standards. You haven't taught if you haven't been kicked off of the internet right in the middle of a lesson. So I'll go to Louisiana and so student standards. And so, like I said, let's say if I was in kind of find fifth grade, you notice that it lists the fifth grade standards to so develop a model, describe the matter that's made of particles too small to be seen. And so maybe I want to address that standard. And so I can go to uh, phases of water. And so you can change water vapor, heat. Um, I have to, yeah, you can see the water uh, level increasing due to the temperature. And so you can play with the thing with, with them, um, obviously, but you notice it also has assessments down here at the bottom for this one. And so it's really uh, built with a teacher in mind and they're very user friendly. Um, and so, like I said, I used them whole group because I didn't have the paid version, um, but they do have resources to uh, fund those. All right, so I'm gonna go back out of here. Like I was saying earlier, um, we have, um, I was directing you to uh, FET. And so what FET is, is uh, interactive simulations and it's built by the University of Colorado in Boulder. And so they have similar, it's not necessarily aligned to teaching standards by state, but um, I would find my content and say, okay, let's say I was teaching motion and I could pull up the balancing act and, um, play and sometimes I would download those. You notice there was a download button. Sometimes I would download those those uh, simulations in advance just in case the internet did not decide to cooperate that day. Um, and so you can move the items. And uh, for those of you that are concerned about uh, state testing and drag and drop, this is obviously one of those things that definitely gets kids interactive and uh, moving objects and uh, analyzing things um, as they uh, explore, right? So uh, it does kind of walk them through as uh, their task. You see it adds bricks now. Um, they can choose people. So I can go to the game and it gives me a little challenge. I can start up my certain levels. Um, and so what I need to do to balance me, so I put it up there, uh, and I think obviously that's not going to work. So I can try again and move my mass to there. If I want to use my rulers to help me, uh, hit check and I can move on to the next one. And so again, there are a, uh, quite a few of these, uh, uh, simulations. Um, and again, they're uh, categorized based upon uh, content. Um, and so uh, that's a free resource. And so you don't need a grant for that. So that again, that's just a sample of resources that that we have. Um, Nicole, I'm going to bounce back just to see what our group looks like. And, and so it looks like our uh, we have the same uh, results, so we're going to keep moving forward. Um, but again, this is just a, um, a sample, um, and hopefully this is just some tools that I used when I was in the classroom. Um, I taught physics and physical science, uh, ninth grade and uh, uh, upperclassmen, and so um, I would still use those gizmos uh, even with the seniors just to, uh, especially with circuits. Um, uh, in, in the FET simulation, things that I did not have materials um, that was readily available. Um, and so I would use that um, as, a, as a substitute. And so 
we have another poll that we'd like to take. And so we're going to share this, um, if you don't mind, uh, responding to this poll, because we'd really be interested in seeing who has written and received a grant uh, in the past. And um, So we know there are those out there that have written a grant and received it. Maybe you wrote one, but it wasn't funded, or maybe you wrote one, but you just never <laughs> wanted to get feedback of whether you're going to receive it or not, or maybe you just didn't finish it, um, or maybe you've never attempted. So we're going to go ahead and move forward. I believe the results, I know we have three results so far. So let's see what pops up. Yes, and receive funding. So that kind of gives us an idea of um, those of you that have written a grant and received it. That's great. Uh, it's great to hear. So some of this information um, will hopefully be reminders and uh, you can build it. Um, but any viewers that have never written a grant, um, it will, should uh, directly benefit you. So I'm gonna pass the torch on to Nicole and allow her to share her screen, um, and we'll talk about grants. Okay, so... Hey, Nicole, I'm sorry, you're muted. <laughs> okay, so you can be, um, so this part of the grant, it doesn't necessarily cover just tips for STEM teachers. This will cover for the English teachers, the Spanish teacher, the speech teacher, PE, art teachers. This applies to anyone writing a grant for their classroom. So we're going to go over this and we're going to go over the who, what, why, when, how of writing a grant. And let's see if I can forward my slide. Okay, so why do we write grants? We write grants to fund projects that impact student learning. Um, we request funds to purchase equipment in order to support project implementation. And the reason why we're saying this is that Nathan and I, we've written grants, but we also are on, um, we volunteer to review grant proposals as well for funding. And one of the things we noted, a lot of the writers, um, they focus more on the equipment they're writing for instead of a project that they're implementing in their class to impact student learning. Um, that the equipment's going to be used for. So when you write a grant, the main purpose is to write about a project where you're going to impact student learning. So student learning is the important thing when you're writing a grant. And so um, again, it's very important when you're starting to formulate and figure out grants, they're used to purchase equipment to meet the students' needs aligned to learning standards. And so we put these photos up if um, you guys want to comment in the chat, what are the differences between this photo, photo one, photo two, and then photo three here? And think about what that statement we have on each as well. If you, if you want to comment, what do you think we're trying to drive home, the point we're trying to drive home with this? And so, and I can't see any of the comments, so I'm going to move on. <laughs> and the reason being, um, in the first photo, the teacher's using the technology. The second photo, the students are engaged with using the technology that was possibly purchased by the grant or possibly purchased by the school. And then we have the teacher helping the students uh, with the equipment that was funded. And so the next of writing grants, after the why, so when do you start writing grants? So actually you can start at any time. So I highly recommend when you're in your class and you have an idea, jot it down, jot it down any time of the year when you identify a need in your class. 
something that your students need uh, work on in your class. Talk to your colleagues about your ideas. So again, anytime you can be thinking about and working on these grants. Most grants are offered annually. So if you miss the deadline for one year, usually it's around the same time the following year. So you want to add that to your calendar for the next year. There are some grants um, that are ongoing where they accept and fund proposals like monthly or bi-monthly throughout the year. So you may want to be aware of those as well. Um, you do want to give yourself lots of time to meet the grant deadline when you are writing your grant. Um, sometimes um, the grants require approval from your administrators. You may want to ask some friends to review your grants. So you need give yourself lots of time to have your proposal reviewed, make some tweaks to it before you actually submit it. And then at, from the viewpoint of a reviewer, when proposals are submitted at the last minute, it's very obvious to the reviewer. So, so keep, keep that in mind. Nicole, can I add something real quick before you move on? Sure. So, um, as a, as a classroom teacher, when I was in the classroom, um, if I was going through a lesson and and kind of uh, identified it would be neat if I had X, Y, and Z, then that was kind of on my uh, to-do list to request things for grants. And so that's when I would start searching. But um, I let uh, my instruction or, or, or rather gaps in instruction, I guess, um, or lack of equipment um, or just ease of equipment, then that's when I would uh, make that list for my grants for the following year. Okay, so we've covered the why and the when, so where do you start? So again, I'm gonna say it again, identify needs during instruction, make note of it, discuss your ideas with colleagues. If you are involved in various groups, you may receive district or state announcements from newsletters, sites, um, professional development. Um, if you're part of an organization like the Louisiana Science Teachers Association or the Louisiana Association of Teachers of Math or the National Science Teachers Association, you might get um, grant um, requests for proposal announcements through those newsletters. And if you do get those grants, take the initiative. Don't be afraid. Just Step into it and take the initiative to write your grant um, to get equipment for your class and your funding, your funding. To, complete to complete this project this. to student learning. So the next question that we wanted to answer is who? So the who, why are the who you're writing the grant for? You're writing the grant for the students. You need to know, identify their grade level, how many students and what their needs are. And when possible, when you're writing a grant, you may want to collaborate with a co colleague. Um, I know one year, uh, Nathan wrote a grant. He was teaching physics, and he wrote a grant that he collaborated with the chemistry teacher, and they had that grant funded. So do collaborate with your colleagues as well. Also, have your colleagues or friends um, have an educator review your proposal, and you may want a friend who's outside of education to review your proposal. It's not always educators who are reviewing these classroom grant proposals. So you have it written in enough time so your colleagues and friends can review it and give you feedback so you can tweak it a little bit before you actually submit that grant proposal. And can I speak to something about that, Nicole? Is um, most of y'all know in education, we have tons of acronyms. We're almost like the military. Maybe we're worse than the military where we have hundreds of acronyms. So be careful about using acronyms in your proposals because if there is a reader that's not familiar with education uh, lingo, then um, sometimes you know what you're saying, but uh, they don't know what you're saying by the use of the acronym and, and whatnot. So um, that is why we suggest to make sure that you have someone even if it's a, a a family member that's not in education, just, hey, read this, tell me what, what you think my, I'm trying to ask for in my project so that they have, um, um, you have that outside uh, uh, input. So just something more of a lesson learned than, uh, <laughs> all right. Okay, so the how, so again, you want to identify your students' needs, 
what are you what areas are your students weak in what kind of equipment what kind of activities might help them to meet those needs you want to determine your project goals based on your students needs plan a timeline for implementation of your project um, all grant proposals do have a timeline listed in the RFPs, so you want to make sure that you can actually complete the project in the amount of time that the um, grant funding is required. So make sure you can complete that project within a given time frame. You also need to determine what resources you'll need to implement your project, so what kind of equipment. I know we all get excited about the equipment part because this is what we can purchase. And and I keep using the word equipment, but you may um, some grants may also allow you to have funds for travel, take your students on a field trip, um, take them to some museums or labs or coastal centers. Uh, here in South Louisiana, we have lots of those, um, lots of coastal centers. So um, Keep in mind, it's not just equipment. It all depends on the guidelines that you get from the grant, what you can actually write for. Um, you do, again, we've probably said this multiple times, you do wanna make sure you align your project to learning standards. And you also, like I just said, you need to know the guidelines for the RFP as well. And something to add before we move on to goals. Um, um, I know there was a, uh, an English teacher in the audience and so, um, I know a teacher locally wrote a grant to fund to be able to take her students to a play in New Orleans. And so um, think outside the box and, and uh, you know, unique stuff that students don't necessarily get to experience. And um, those students probably had not been a play to a play in their uh, life. And so um, it was an opportunity and she was meeting their needs. And so uh, I know we've mentioned it a couple of times and a couple of slides and, and it'll continue to um, uh, be posted and listed. And I know Maria um, quite a grant in the past and so, uh, congratulations to you. Um, but um, I, write with your students in mind. It's all about what your students need, not what the teacher needs. And so a lot of times when we're reading proposals and we read stuff, what the teacher needs or this will make me my uh, job easier or whatnot. Remember you're writing with the students in mind. And I'm going to write this again. Your project goals, they need to be they need to be smart goals. They should be specific. They need to be measurable. So you need to be able to evaluate whether or not the students met those goals. The goals should be attainable. They also need to be relevant to the request for proposal. So within the scope of the grant proposal, um, the um, project needs to be relevant to that. And it also, like I said, it has to be time bound. You have to be able to complete the project when within the given amount of time that's allowed um, through the funding agency. Um, Something that Nathan and I notice a lot when we're reviewing grant proposals, a lot of teachers try to conquer the world when they're writing their proposal. They list every activity they could do for the whole school year, apart from the project, with the materials and equipment they have requested. So remember, you're requesting to fund a project to meet the students' needs. You're not trying to, um, it's not about, how much you can do with the equipment, but the quality of what you can do with the equipment within the scope of that project. So the project is the important part and quality of that project is much more important than quantity of what you can do with the equipment in that project. So keep that in mind. That's that a really important really thing. Important. If, you if you keep that in mind and follow that main rule, you'll be able to, um, write a really good focused proposal. Something to add to that, Nicole, is um, so when I was in the classroom, uh, when I wrote my first grant, I wrote my uh, I wrote a grant for graphing calculators. And so um, when I did that, I could do lots of activities with those graphing calculators throughout the entire year. But I had to remember that my focus was on one project one one part of that uh, entire year and so my project was just for um, 
um, a few activities that was just a unit. And so um, that's when I was going to use those calculators and those probes uh, for that amount of time, even though I knew um, outside of the grant, I was going to use it for other things. When I wrote, I had to stay focused on uh, how I was going to use those calculators and that project for those activities, not the entire uh, scope of the year. So. Okay, so again, we're answering our next question. So what ingredients do you need? Really, the main um, ingredients you need follow the request for proposal documentation. Any funding agency that puts out requests for proposals to fund projects have all of the guidelines and procedures all clearly outlined. Be sure you follow those um, guidelines. You wanna provide, like I said, the exact information requested. You, be, you should be detailed and focused as possible Whenever possible, reference research articles are, I know as teachers, we like to borrow and share lots of different ideas. If you get ideas from other web websites or other teachers, you can actually uh, make sure you cite those um, that documentation when you're using and sharing other teachers' um, projects. Also, you're going to need to pro provide quantitative data to justify your need. So instead of saying, oh, some of my students are weak in this and some of my students are strong in this, you would want to use percentages of your students. Use some exact numbers and be quantitative. Don't give broad general generalizations describing your group of students. And again, you want to Make sure there's a focus, focus on a specific project with specific learning outcomes that are measurable. Don't be general, don't be broad. Um, as reviewers, we've seen many, many grant submissions and they're very generalized about how the equipment's going to use. There's no specific outlined, um, I'm going to use recipe for lack of a better term, as to how they are going to go through to teach their students to improve that weakness. Um, so you want to be very detailed in your plan and lay that out so that the review can imagine that in, in their mind. So, and I often tell teachers um, that if someone, someone picked up your proposal that someone else should be able to replicate exactly what you're gonna do with your students in the classroom. And again, be detailed, include all your strategies and lessons involved in the project. And I think that goes back to having a uh, project, a specific project in mind, because a lot of times we think, oh, what can I do with all these calculators? Or what can I do with all these Chromebooks or, or whatever equipment that I'm writing for? I don't know this technology, but um, how many times can you use a graduated cylinder? Or how many activities can you use a graduated cylinder for in a science class? Well, even though you could use it for a numerous activities, what is the activity that your project is based around? And that's why you're writing uh, for uh, that to address that activity. And that's where it helps to be focused um, on that project and not necessarily the scope of the school year, even though um, you know you're going to use it for other things. So something else that um isn't often thought about are things when you're putting your budget together. You want to be sure you're able to purchase from the vendor you're receiving the quote or the price for. Um, high cost items might require you to obtain multiple quotes. You may want to be able to ask your principal to match. Um, certain vendors may be required by your district for certain products, so you need to check with your administration on that. Um, also, don't forget to include shipping costs, and you do want to stay in budget. Don't go over budget. That'll cause um, not immediate disqualifications, but it's not very helpful to uh, reviewers if you do go over budget. Before we move on real quick. So um, I threw in the little point about the principal. Uh, I probably threw it in this morning without Nichols <laughs> noticing. And so um, the 
you know, sometimes I would go to the principal of like, hey, look, I'll write a grant, you know, for a thousand dollars or whatever. Can you meet me halfway or will you pay the shipping cost if I write the grant so I can I can maximize my budget? And so um, sometimes if principals see that you have that initiative, sometimes they'll be willing to throw in a couple of dollars of school funds um, if that's available just to uh, support you. And so I think that would be uh, incentive to teachers. And so if there's any administrators out there, um, I think that's uh, definitely a way that you could support teachers. Hey, write this grant, I'll pay your shipping or I'll match your funds um, or however that that allows. But um, don't forget about the shipping costs. Sometimes teachers will write that budget and then um, maximize the total number of uh, Chromebooks they can purchase, but uh, they got to get to the district somehow or the school. So. Okay, and then once you've come up with your budget, you do need to figure out how you're going to evaluate the effectiveness of your project. So. How will you determine the impact of your project? You're going to want to use formative and summative assessments, include collect and include quantitative data. Um, and this is because the funding agency, they want to know if their funds were well spent. Did they, um, you know, they gave you some money. So how, how well did your project go? And the data that you've gathered can actually drive your next grant proposal. So when you're evaluating your project, be honest. Um, did some of the things that you used with the, um, some of the teaching techniques you used with the equipment, did it improve? Did it impact student learning positively? Were there things that you can improve on from, um, from the project? Keep that in mind. That's a big part of um, grant proposals once the grant process is actually over, um, once it's funded. And I'll just want to speak to the qualitative versus quantitative. You know, the quantitative, we talked about how important it is the data to drive your grant proposal uh, to include for the student needs. And so if you um, implement a grant uh, one year and you collect that data, collect that data and use it to drive the next grant proposal for the following year. Um, you know, my students um, or you have identified a weakness that your students uh, may have. And so you can write the next grant proposal to address that. And so um, while the qualitative data is uh, beneficial, um, we can't stress the importance of having the quantitative. OK. and. Once you get funded with a grant, it doesn't end with the money in your hand. You still have a lot of work to do. You have to purchase the equipment. You have to manage the budget. You have to carry out the proposed project. You have to evaluate the proposed project. And then with through that evaluation, you submit your final report to the funding agency. So the grant writing is the pre-award phase. And then you get funded, but then there's a post-award phase as well. So it's it's almost like a marathon when you're writing a grant. But you are, the purpose of it is to impact your student learning. So you can get um, experiences and more equipment in the classroom to impact your student learning. So there's always a um, that goal for that. So we wanted to pause for a second just to see if anyone had any questions. But if y'all have any questions, please uh, post them in the chat and in the comments so we can address them. But um, I think we're going to keep forward. Um, but if you have a question, we'll address it as it is. As it. Okay. okay, so we Talk talked about, about best practices for grants. Grant. And now we want to share some STEM grant resources. So Nathan, if you want to go over that. Yep. Uh, real quick. And there we go. So, um, QSM is a is is a grant that's available to lo only Louisiana math and science public school teachers. Um, the deadline's um, uh, November thirtieth, um, and I put STEM in action kits just because that is a great example of how uh, 
if you saw if you wanted to implement stem and action kits then this is a great grant to to be able to do that that is just this is the first grant that i wrote in my career and um i know nicole and i talked about teachers taking the initiative um i guess the part of my initiative was to uh participate in something called LACIP. it no longer exists anymore um unfortunately but LACIP was a professional development for uh, math and science teachers and so part one of our activities was summer it was a summer uh, PD, but one of our activities was to write a QSM grant, and then the uh, professor scored it to give us, that was an outside reader, um, and gave us feedback, and then and we submitted it, and I got it. And so once I got that one under, under my belt, then um, I felt a little bit more confident that wasn't so bad. And so it was all downhill from there um, until I was writing larger grants. Um, um, and like Nicole said, you know, I worked with the chemistry teacher later on. We did a CSI project uh, for the school um, and uh, it obviously had a lot larger scope. He did the chemistry part. I did the physics part um, and where students learned how to solve a murder. I kind of going off on a tangent. But my point is, is that that QSM grant is how it got my uh, feet wet. And uh, that's how I got started. And so that's all it takes is, is just to, to get one under, under your belt and then continue. So a QSM is for STEM in action. Uh, Lego Robotics, are you seeking classroom funding? And so I put links um, that they provide in order to support teachers and schools um, that want to implement this. So you can see 2020 Louisiana First Lego League uh, Team Hardship uh, grant registration. Like I said earlier, John Deere is a big supporter of uh, uh, First Lego League. And so I'm just going to click on John Deere real quick. Um, and you notice that um, here's the grants, here's their deadlines. And like Nicole said, some of these deadlines have passed like November, uh, well, not November 20th. I guess they're removing the deadlines as they, as they, uh, that's the competition. So, um, but as the deadlines are advanced, put them on your calendars uh, in the future. And then you could probably put this calendar, you know, on your calendar for November 20th, 2021, because they're probably going to be somewhere around that time of year uh, next year. Um, but you notice down here, current U.S. John Deere Inspire Home Communities. And we have one in Thibodeau in Louisiana, and they support uh, some teams in Lafourche Parish and, and uh, Terrebonne Parish. Um, but you can see kind of the, where the, their locations are in order to support uh, schools. Um, but don't, you know, that's just an example. Don't limit yourself. If you have a, uh, a business in your community, um, especially an engineering uh, firm or, or uh, something of that nature, reach out to them um, and just tell them, give them the idea. Um, and maybe you don't have to necessarily have to write a grant, but you just have to do a little sales pitch asking uh, for, for the funds. So um, I'm going to jump to the are you seeking funding? And so Lego Education has these. Uh, uh, some of you may be familiar with Donors Choose. They talk about grant writing. And uh, they even have a grant writing tip uh, down here, which is uh, some of the information that we've shared uh, previously. And then uh, grant funding for Explore Learning, uh, Gizmos, which is e-learning. And then, whoops. And then uh, FET, like I said earlier, those simulations are free. And so we just tried to provide the resources for, or the grant resources for the STEM resources that we shared uh, previously. Um, something that we wanted to talk about was the type of grants. Obviously, as you, um, as the grant hits a wi wider audience or is available to a wider audience, obviously the competition increases. And so obviously federal grants are a lot tougher to um, um, secure than, than some of the, the uh, smaller ones like state or local, private, et cetera. So Terrebonne Parish actually has a foundation, Terrebonne Foundation for Academic Excellence has a foundation where it's limited to teachers in Terrebonne Parish. And so that was a uh, 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 some businesses got together and they fund that. Um, but teachers write grants, and so it's 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 a source of funds that's only limited to Terrebonne Parish. So those were always, you know, that was I guess less competition than even the QSM. But even with QSM, I knew it was only with math and science teachers. So look for grants that can set you up for success. Nicole, you have something to add for that? Um. 
I think the main thing is is to identify organizations in your, your local community um, that offer grants. In Ramon and Lafourche Parish, we have the Baratari Terrebonne Estuary Program. They offer a grant once a year. Once a year. Um, the State Environmental Education Commission offers small grants once a year. So familiarize with any grant opportunities locally if you haven't written any grants before. And if you have and you feel comfortable, then you may want to expand to federal level grants or private companies. Shell offers, for example, a, a, um, a lab for your school grant. And so um, that's a national level grant funding competition. So be sure if you're just starting out, you may want to start small, local with nonprofits. And if you have quite a bit of experience, expand to federal and private companies that are national level grant funded companies. So the next thing that we wanted to add was just a list of uh, grant resources, um, not necessarily specific to um, Lego or, or any of that. Um, it wasn't designated necessarily for any specific funds um, or equipment. Um, and so it's just a brainstorm. But uh, one of the things that we wanted to touch on is something we're going to uh, mention in a minute. But uh, just as an example, there's something called the e-blast and so in Louisiana. And um, I believe it's they should have it in each uh, state. Um, but it's a list of teachers can receive a list of STEM resources and opportunities from the Science Matters Network, and they subscribe to it when they become a member of the Louisiana Science Teachers Association. And, and basically, um, that blast of uh, resources, it may be grant opportunities, but it may, may also be PD opportunities. Um, it's, it's informational, but um, that's where you can Again, we talk about taking initiative, just put your name on a list to receive the email, and then you can just browse through it if you're looking for funding sources. And so um, obviously there's lots of other sources outside of this, but uh, that's where you, you can go hunt. And I think I think one of these, uh, Nicole, you may uh, talk to it, but uh, I don't know if it's stemgrants.com or grants for teachers uh, or even the Brown Foundation is is a list of it's a compilation of grants. Yeah, yeah the teachers.com teachers website mm -hmm. and cyber.org and um, links for learning. All of those items are outside, not necessarily just STEM related education grants. So those are outside. So if you're teaching Spanish or speech or ELA, you may want to go to those sites to find additional grant opportunities. Whoops. So the another thing that we wanted to mention, and this is just, again, part of the uh, uh, aspect of grants because um, it goes back to the collaboration and, and, and brainstorming and whatnot, but um, I can't I, this is probably just a side note, but how important networking is for educators um, to be able to help one another. I could probably use uh, Michelle as an example of, you know, it's just we have a workshop. I didn't know Michelle at the end of the workshop, but now she asked us to present uh, to this group. And so it's just one of those things where um, we're working together um, with the same uh, purpose. And so anyway, joined identify and join uh, those organizations. And I know we're kind of preaching to the choir because you wouldn't be a part of the uh, Google for Educators uh, group. So um, anyway, we have the Louisiana Science Teachers Association. Um, we have free membership through February. Um, and, you know, just as important as a teacher award, I mean, the uh, grants are, it's also the part where sometimes we have to publicize ourselves if you're selected as teacher of the year or there's you, you're recognized uh, for an award. And so sometimes you have to put together a, um, a portfolio or a packet. Um, and so that grant, those grant writing techniques uh, aid in that. Um, and again, so as an example, uh, the Science Teachers Association has a newsletter that comes out every other month. And it again, it has PD opportunities. We have a sister organization with the math teachers. 
And then one more plug is the National Science Teachers Association has a virtual conference coming up. It's next week. Um, and so part of the benefit is you notice you can notice the uh, the reduced cost uh, registration costs for being a member of NSTA or LSTA. So just by joining free to LSTA, um, you can get fifty dollars off the registration for that. So anyway, it's just um, when you attend these conferences and obviously uh, I guess I maybe I'm old school, but I prefer the face to face. If I, you know, at a conference, it, um, I take away the networking opportunities um, almost more than some of the PD sessions um, when I attend these conferences. So um, and like I think Nicole mentioned earlier, sometimes they offer grants uh, for teachers to attend some of these uh, PD opportunities. Nicole, did you want to add something to networking? Yes, hang on. <laughs> okay, it's fun trying to do this uh, from two different computers in the same room. Um, so for science networking, not just go out and find organizations, but find some local nonprofits that you may want to work with. Um, as a member of the Louisiana, the Louisiana Science Teachers Association, as an association as a whole, we actually affiliate with other organizations throughout the state. So the Science Teachers Association is part of the LISTEM Council. We, um, one of our members sits on the LISTEM Council. We have a seat at the management conference for the Barataria Terrebonne Estuary Program. We have a lot of our members are reviewers for the QSM grant writing process. So not just science teacher organizations, but also network with your local nonprofits that LUMCON is another one, for example. Um, I know over around Hammond, there's LIGO, so for science type um, networking opportunities. So familiarize yourself with other local nonprofits that you may think the interactions would benefit your students. Yep. Wildlife and Fisheries is another example. They're, they're, they're a big supporter of education. So the next um, pretty much just in the grants. And so um, I'm just sharing something. I, Nicole and I attended a, a session um, the other day. Uh, it was a free session put on by NSTA and, and um, um, I believe it was NSTA. Um, and the person did something that I wasn't familiar with. And so I just wanted to share it out, share, share that tip. So this is just bonus. Um, so I wasn't familiar that uh, or necessarily how to use uh, the Q&A in Google Slides. Obviously, if you have a chat, if you're pre presenting virtually, there's a chat window. And, and so you can do that. But if you're face to face and you're chatting or even this is really um, with a teacher in mind uh, for students, if students have devices, um, is the Q&A down here um, in the presentation mode. Um, and if you click the Q&A, I believe you will. Nicole, can you see it? I, yeah, it's, it's showing. Good. So you notice this uh, shows audience tools and then speaker notes. And so um, obviously we can jump to our slides and see speaker notes as, as we move back and forth. But the audience tools, if we start new, you'll notice it throws um, ask a question at this link uh, above. And so I'm um, thinking with a teacher in mind if I'm presenting. And so um, it's like a parking lot for students. And so students can post their questions here. And I, I think that would really help um, probably in a virtual setting because the teacher is not always able to um, field all those questions or it's not, not as easy as seeing a hand raised. Um, but students can type those questions in real time um, as they're going through. And so if one of y'all want to try to uh, try and type click on that link, um, you can post a question in there and they'll show up. And when you exit, because one of the, the things is how to get those questions in the tools section of your uh, of Google Slides, you can see Q&A history. And when you click Q&A history, um, it will pull up um, the the, the questions that were asked during that session or that presentation. And so you can always go back to it for future reference, um, especially if you're presenting something the following year um, after you have. So that's something that we learned today. So I just wanted to share it, uh, especially to this group. Um, so that, like I said, that's kind of line up as we would say in Louisiana. 
And so um, that's basically the wraps up the presentation. Um, if you have any questions, those are our emails. Please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we are um, always welcome to support uh, educators um, in order to uh, get their feet wet um, writing a grant um, or, or whatever it may be. So um, we hope you were able to take away at least something um, from the session. Thank y'all so much. So, there was so many great points shared. Um, I especially love that you drove home the point of focus. Um, I, I'm so grateful and I love that y'all threw in a Google Tech tip at the end. And one of the things I would advise if you're not from Louisiana, they gave out towards the very end a lot of specific tips and it was tagged and labeled for South Louisiana. But if you're not from South Louisiana, um, I, I strongly encourage you find the STEM specialist in your area. Um, I know when I'm trying to do certain things in my curriculum for my class, even though they're not in my particular parish, as he alluded to networking earlier, I've emailed um, the Cottons and they've responded within hours. They're phenomenal, just wonderful people. And uh, just last year I was like, we're teaching on um, creating clean water. And so who can I, I go to in my area? This is where my school is located. Who can give me a global perspective to share that with my kids? And through their networking uh, sources, they connected me with um, the Baton Rouge Water Institute. And then my students were able to partake of that. And so again, grants is a great opportunity, but don't ever underestimate the, the power of utilizing human capital and the power of collective efficacy. And that's kind of, as you said earlier, the power a global gay, that we're stronger together. And so they've given you so much information and I just appreciate your time. I know Miss Patty is back there working her magic. And so, um, but we just wanna send you off and thank you for your time. And as I said, reach out to them if you have any questions and reach out to the people in your area and, and give your students the world because they deserve it. Y'all have a great night. Thank y'all so much. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks. Thank y'all, thank y'all. Thank you.